so let's uh, move quickly on then. Um, we're going to change now a little bit from, uh, uh, from the business case side, sort of shifting gear a little bit to look at uh, mobile and the impact of NFV and mobile. And um, so the first person up is going to be uh, Azhar Saeed from uh, Cisco. He's the director of solutions engineering at Cisco um, and got uh, over 20 years experience uh, of, of uh, engineering and networking in, in uh, this or sort of being a solution architect or social engineer within Cisco for a number of years and, uh, and also has uh, I guess uh, an, a few patents against his name and uh, very much got a lot of uh, experience in, uh, in the mobile space. So, uh, Thank you Phil. I appreciate your introduction there. Um, so what we're going to, to talk about in this section as part of the mobile kickstart is we'll take a voice over LTE as an example and run through that voice over LTE an example and what are some of the challenges we faced as we started to build this and as we started to virtualize different components and then bring them together and orchestrate them. Um, so we'll very, very quickly uh, you know, run through some of the architectures and some of the setups first. And then we'll deep dive into one of the topics that's actually very interesting in the context of orchestration, SDN, and NFV, which is high availability elasticity. And we'll actually spend most of the presentation on that section. Okay, uh, you've seen the Volti architecture. This is, there's nothing new here. There's nothing different here. This is a straight copy from you know, the, um, the reference architecture for LTE uh, from the ITU spec. But what we are going to focus on is this side, which is the IMS components. And what we did was to start taking those IMS components from Cisco and third party. So I'm going to talk to you about some various different challenges we ran into when we started to do this. Um, and so we look at the third party IMS components, integrate that with Cisco EPC, and then virtualize the whole thing, and then orchestrate the whole thing, and then come up with a result, and eventually take it to a service provider to say, now you go deploy it. And it's quite interesting in terms of what happened and how we saw. Focus was on OpenStack, but there's also VMware in this, and I'll actually point out in one of the slides what the differences between OpenStack and VMware were, and how you know, we had to use both to, in order to accomplish a solution. And in terms of a very quick topology and network design, in virtual, to connect all of these compute nodes and storage nodes and so on, is very, very simple top of the rack switch that connects all of these capabilities. You need to have some build servers. Build servers were extremely important in order to initialize a specific environment and in order to orchestrate a specific environment. And then you have you know, the VNFM or VNF managers and then you have the OpenStack controller node and the, and the various different compute nodes that are instantiated or the VMs that are spawned as we uh, go through the you know, setup, as we set up the overall environment. Now, here's the first picture in terms of that gives you a difference between the OpenStack and the VMware space. First of all, the terminology is different between the two. Um, one uses what is called as a Virtual data center, provider virtual data center, another one, another one uses what is called as the availability zone. Um, one calls it an organization. The other one calls it a tenant. You know? And so there are some of these subtle differences in terms of how you look at VMware and use vCloud Air to be able, uh, vCloud Suite to be able to orchestrate that and how you would use OpenStack and the standard OpenStack model to be able to do that. And we'll actually see a little bit more. Now, you've seen this slide for the last two days. I don't want to spend any time talking over this particular slide. This is what Etsy NFV reference architecture, right? What I want to show you in this slide is how the Volti components, voice over LTE components, map here. So at the bottommost layer, what you see is the UCS, that's the hardware, and the storage capabilities with appropriate hypervisor, which is KVM or ESXi in my particular context with you know, the orchestrator capabilities on OpenStack or VMware. And the controller, which is either the OpenStack controller or the vCloud director. Now there is a VNFM manager, which, is, which we call it as CTCM. And uh, the reason why I was chiding Diego this morning was we did exactly the same thing what Diego did. He started off a year and a half ago, and we started off a year and a half ago, at that time, the maturity of OpenStack wasn't there. So we picked up an environment with a third party, and we started to build on that particular environment. That environment became 
our environment for managing the VNF, virtual network functions. And so we call it CTCM. Now, eventually, this will all merge into OpenStack. So no, I have not abandoned OpenStack, right? And this will all become part of the heat templates, the neutron plugins, and the ability to actually orchestrate the, the VMs through that. If you look at the um, various different virtual machines that run different functions for voice over LTE, that's where they get mapped into in terms of virtual network functions. And then right on the top, there's catalog capability, the fulfillment center, the NSO for network service provisioning, and the standard or new OSSBSS. So that's kind of the entirety of the uh, HCNFV architecture. And all of these different components is what we ended up happening to experiment and work with and fix issues and go on until we could find a workable solution in order to be able to virtualize everything and then get it to a service provider for, for deployment. These were all the components that were virtualized. Obviously, there were some things that are not virtualized, but then those are irrelevant in that case. Radio virtualization, Cisco doesn't produce radios. We don't have a CPRI capability, but if there's somebody out there in radio who has CPRI, sure, you can do that as well. Right? Orchestration is a piece of software that we're using. An IS platform, I talked about the two different IS platforms already. Now, let's dig a little bit more and go into some more details on orchestration. What is the orchestration capability? What we need in orchestration is the ability to automate management, arrangement, and coordination of all of these virtual machines with network capabilities, software systems, middleware, and services. What do we need specifically? We need the ability to do auto installs. We need the ability to create an environment. We need the ability to provision those organizations and tenants that we spoke about. We need the ability to auto start them, monitor them for help, because it's extremely important. If you don't know what's going on in a virtual machine, and if you don't know what's going on within that particular virtual machine, you have no idea what's, what's happening in your network. At least in a physical network, you have these lead blinking lights. There are no lead blinking lights in a virtual environment, right? So monitoring for help becomes extremely important. Uh, monitoring for elasticity. What is the load? Where are we with that load? And th that's where we'll spend service elasticity, high availability, we'll spend a considerable amount of time. Configuration management and upgrade and patch management capabilities. Some, if you look at, you know, if you're building an IIS platform or a PaaS capability, platform capability, then what you need in that IIS or PaaS capability is you need in hypervisor independent environment. You don't want. Now, when we started to build it, we ran into trouble. There were some you know, partners of ours who made some choices. They made a choice to say, well, we are going to support VMware ESXi and optimize our VNFs with VMware ESXi. The other said, oh, well, we can do OpenStack, so they're going to optimize themselves with the KVM capability. Now, obviously, we couldn't get all of that environment in one single space. So not everybody supported KVM, not everybody you know, did VMware. So we had to build this hybrid environment. That is the first challenge we ran into. Now, in that hybrid environment, then, trying to create automated setups of tenants, volumes, networks, et cetera, that's important. That becomes, and so as a service provider, as somebody whom you are going to go deploy, you will run into the exact same problem, okay? The other important piece that we found was we, you need grouping support. The reason why you need grouping support is you have a certain sequences along which you need to bring the VMs together. There is dependencies in terms of the overall environment. For example, a certain you know, function is dependent on another function. That other function, it looks as soon as it boots up in terms of the sequence, it looks for the other function. If it's not there and you have a high availability setup or redundancy built into the environment, it declares it dead and starts to move on. Now suddenly the other node comes up, what happens then? So there is other complexities in the context of state synchronization stuff that you need to worry about, okay? And how do you auto scale? What are the roles? So if we just quickly take a set of steps on the, let's say VMware, let's take the first VMware. What do you need? You need to provision you know, the organizations, tenants, networks, launch the controller. The controller then launches a set of services, the CSCF and TAS and so on and so forth. 
and failures will be detected to say, okay, well, this, this VM has failed, I'm gonna start a new one. And you know, monitor the CPU to say, oh, well, this is running hot, this is running cold, maybe I can shift this load over here from here to here, and so on. Same thing with the OpenStack piece, you can apply the same set of rules. Let me just quickly compare the two while we are comparing VMware and the OpenStack stuff. Uh, the vCloud suite, you see this, this is called an organization, that one's called tenant. You have an admin user in both places. You have an availability zone versus an organization virtual data center. You have organization networks versus a simple set of networks. Here, edge gateway versus router, independent disks versus volumes, and apps versus instances. Again, there's an equivalent set of functionality there in each one of those spaces that you need to be cognizant of. If you write a certain script that runs in one environment, it's, not, it is potentially portable to the other, other environment, but it's not gonna run as is, okay? That's another data point to, be, to, to worry about. Now let's take a look at the physical infrastructure. If you look at the, on the left-hand side, this side, the physical infrastructure is what you see there, top of the rack switch, Nexus, uh, you know, an orchestration build host, and then some set of UCSs that run. There's a one VMware setup, the other one's the OpenStack setup. And you can map, you know, in terms of my particular setup that I was talking about, a voice over LTE and a video, video on demand capability on each one of those, and then try to orchestrate that entire video capability with, with voice over LTE. Now we get a little bit deeper into the service elasticity piece, as well as into the high availability piece. You can design this with some amount of high availability. Virtual machine high availability, what do you mean? You have one for one setup, so one for n setups. You have admin manager, you have resource manager, you have a distribution manager, you have the various service instances, and you have the controllers. Each one of them needs some level of redundancy. Now for each one of them, you need certain amount of memory, virtual CPU, and storage. And you can compute that in order to just get a virtual EPC setup and you know, a Volti setup going, for some number of calls, there is a sizing guideline that you get to. You have about 34 or 35 VMs that you have to bring up in some sort of a sequence and, and order. In particular, the dependencies with respect to what needs to connect to which one first and how, it becomes extremely important. And then you have to know that prior before you just say, so it's not simply a matter of, oh, I got this packaged VNF from a vendor, I'm just gonna push it in into my system and fire it up and it is gonna work. No. So you need that capability, you need that expertise. Now let's double click on the high availability pieces, the service elasticity pieces, and <clears throat> the um, load balancing capabilities. So first, let's, assume, let's make some assumptions. The first assumption is network workshop functions are virtualized, which we saw in our particular case, right? They can be orchestrated very easily, which means they can be brought up, the environment can be brought up, and you have the regular set of scripts to be orchestrating all of these capabilities. You need that flexible model that I showed, shared with you on the previous slide, which is about you know, the redundancy models, one for one, one for n, depending on how large is it gonna to scale to, how much it is going to scale to. And then the, then the question becomes, what is the issue we're gonna solve with respect to high availability in this particular context? The question is, do we need specialized protocols like we did in the physical world? Do we need state synchronization capabilities like we did in the physical world? Do we need that now in the virtual machine or virtual NFV world, rather. So things like stateful switchover, things like state synchronization, things like live live setup, failure detection and pro or, or liveliness stuff, fast reroute, right? Automatic protection switching. Now remember, we are talking about here in, in our context inside the data center. So some of these may be applicable, some of these may not be applicable. What if you take that load in that data center and partition that load across two data centers? Which of them suddenly become applicable? Which of them suddenly don't become applicable? We need to think about these, these set of things in terms of high availability and how they apply. Now let's do some analysis, let's do some digging on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the stateful switchover, what does it do? It was necessary to transfer information from one machine to another machine, 
and preserve state. Why? Because we wanted to bring another machine up in the exact same state as the previous one. Right? What did we assume in the past? There was some monolithic code that was sitting in this machine A, and you wanted the exact same state to be brought up on that machine B. Now, in that context, first of all, in virtualization, you assume that you are running this particular piece of code in a container. Now, I'm going to make an assumption here that the code that's been written for this virtualization is not really optimized for virtualization. So somebody put, took a piece of code, put a wrapper around that particular piece of code, put it into a container, and said, yes, it is virtualized. Right? And when you do that, then obviously the state of that particular machine that's inside this container is going to expect certain behavior and certain response. And if you don't know what that behavior and what that response is, you're going to land yourselves in a soup. Right? So that's important to think about. And as a starting point, if the code, eventually you can take that code apart. First run it into a container, then take it apart, then figure out where the state information is, whether that runs in a separate virtual machine or not, or whether that runs in a separate container or not, and then figure out how to communicate and how to get that information. But there is another way of maintaining and preserving state, which is just creating copies of those machines. How often do you do it? Well, do you do database synchronization today across wide area networks? Yes, you do. It's a well known, it's an art, yes, people have figured it out over a period of time, but they do. So then can you actually create these type of copies? Then do you need those specialized protocols? It's an interesting question. Non-stop forwarding, same, take the same argument and apply it to the forwarding behavior. Okay, same set of arguments, one by one, point by point, you can apply it to the forwarding behavior. So then the question becomes, okay, what about physical layer protection? Do we need that? Well, there may be some physical layer protections that are applicable in the context of your deployment environment with respect to this virtualized capability. So if you have virtualization, that virtualization is load distributed into multiple data centers, then you have some physical layers that are interacting with, with, between those data centers, and yes, you have the same standard methods that are applicable and you can apply them links and nodes across the data center, within the data center, protection between those paths with respect to VLAN, VXLAN, NVGRE, and, and use other techniques such as, you know, um, path creation and so on. But we just saw earlier today some interesting presentations around service chaining inside the data center. Let's now limit ourselves in that domain to inside that data center in terms of how we look at it. We saw the ability to orchestrate and to configure those service chains through the orchestration software. Now, if you do that, do you then need these type of protection capabilities? Because I could potentially, assuming resources are abundant inside the data center, because that's the biggest assumption people make when they build and, or when they move into a virtualized environment. So assuming resources are abundant, you can create multiple service chains. That takes me to my next slide, right? You can create multiple service chains. You can keep them, activate them based on policy. Fair? So when you do that, then the question is, do you need then those type of protection mechanisms, or do you need extensions to the current protection mechanisms to be able to build this? Or maybe we are now completely thinking differently when it comes to providing this level of orchestration and this level of redundancy in the service chain model. Yeah? But then there are other problems. As you build this level of redundancy, or as you build this level of distribution, what happens is you run into a workload partitioning problem. Now, each VM handles a certain portion of the traffic. Then what do you need in front of that? You need load balances in front of that. When, when you get more and more load balances in multiple VMs associated with it, then what do you need next? You need to know how to partition that load across these multiple different VMs. Keep scaling it up, thousands, million subscribers, two million subscribers, <coughs> 10 million subscribers. We are now talking different contexts, different ball game, 
different way of looking at the problem, different way of thinking at it, not the traditional session-based load balancing or not the traditional interface-based load balancing or traffic-based load balancing, right? Why? Because at that point in time, workload distribution is critical. At that point in time, monitoring becomes critical. Assurance becomes critical. So let's go into now assurance and monitoring. Monitoring of data center infrastructure becomes extremely important, both at a physical layer and at a virtual layer. So you need input from the bare metal. You need input from the devices. How hot are they running? How cold are they running? What is the capability? What's the load you can instantiate on it? What's occupied? What's not occupied? Right? And then you need the information also from a virtual layer. It's not enough for you to say my VM is up. You have to know that the, your VM is up, and you have to know your service is up inside that VM. Right? So you need to now monitor at multiple different layers in this particular virtual environment. Again, there are no fancy lights here for you to look at, read, and say, ah, that's the problem. OK? So that makes it, that adds another domain to it, which is the analytics piece. In terms of proactive health uh, monitoring and analyzing information to say, how can I take that piece of information and work through, uh, you know, and uh, get that in, in the context of deployment. Of course, clustering and load balancing becomes an extremely important topic, where VMs, VNFs, or NFVs need to be clustered to perform different tasks, right? So then for that to happen, you need an entity called a distribution manager that says, I'm going to take this load, I'm going to redistribute it across. Now then you get into this information that I mentioned to you a moment ago, which is workload partitioning. Now, assurance managers working with the um, you know, load balancers can provide you some level of distribution and some level of capability. Excuse me. Yeah, we're uh, on time. I know. Or, or out of time. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm done. This is my last slide, literally. So that leads us to the service elasticity portion of it. So if you look at the IaaS pass capability, it needs to be elastic. You need to have look. You need to look at that peak time, average time, and so on. Look at those time scales, and then take that piece and and build elasticity based on appropriate monitoring and appropriate uh, you know consumption. You can have state machines maintain shadow state and copies of the information, um, and run that capability. So net net in terms of uh, a summary. Hypervisor independent orchestration is important. You need to have that because we saw this problem. We have two different environments. You almost have to run them in parallel. You almost have to worry about it. You can try to integrate it, but it has its own set of challenges. Any NFV environment is specific to that particular type. The ordering and sequencing becomes extremely important. Workload distribution is a complex problem. Real time versus near real time with respect to monitoring, assurance, and serviceability. And traditional hedging models don't apply, obviously. Delivering high availability in this particular world might be completely different than what we've previously thought. And some of the approaches, interestingly, there's a draft in the ITF, which I wasn't a big fan of, I'm sure. People come around to correcting that and working on it in a different way for NFVs. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent, SR. I think that summed up an, uh, a number of the real challenges and things to be thinking about when taking, I guess, and, and again, taking the traditional approach we have to uh, taking that functional software as we have today and adapting that to a new VNF. It does require a lot of, uh, as you decompose that VNF, a lot of uh, re-engineering, rethinking. Absolutely. Bootstrapping legacy stuff is not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.